I just wanted to personally welcome you to the first in-person and virtual Wu University hybrid event. Super, super exciting. So this is the first one. We've got some in-person attendees, and then we also have about 520 people online viewing this presentation as well. So super, super exciting. Just want to say thanks to Ivantis for supporting this event with an unrestricted grant. And it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Tigran Castanian. He, his uh, biography and list of accolades is very impressive, and I think you guys will be equally as impressed. Dr. Castanian was born in Armenia, and he graduated from Yerevan State Medical University with honors at age 21. That in itself is super impressive. Most of us were graduating college if we were lucky at that age, let alone Dr. Castanian is graduating medical school with honors. He then completed his ophthalmology residency at Malayan Eye Center in Yerevan. And then after moving to the United States, he had to complete a second ophthalmology residency. And he's also glaucoma and anterior segment fellowship at the University of Pitts Pittsburgh Medical Center. So not only one residency, but two residencies. I think all of us would have given up by then. Dr. Castanian specializes in cataract and medical laser and surgical treatments of glaucoma. He has numerous peer reviewed publications and has presented his work in local and national meetings. He is fluent in Armenian, Russian, and plans on refreshing his French and learning Spanish. So please welcome Dr. Tigran Castanian. Dr. Wu, thanks for uh, your kind introduction and thanks for uh, organizing this event and thanks uh, Iventis for unrestricted grant and uh, thanks all of you for joining. It's exciting to be able to do uh, the event uh, in person. It looks like we're slowly getting back to uh, normal. So uh, we're going to talk about glaucoma and specifically uh, minimally invasive surgeries uh, and focusing mostly on the trabecular meshwork stents. So uh, uh, as financial disclosures, I'm consultant for Iventis, which is uh, uh, the Hydrus Microstent is their product. Um, so we'll talk about glaucoma, just basics, um, overview, look into re recent mixed trials, uh, discuss the preoperative counseling and postoperative care of the patients who had uh, cataract and mixed procedures, a dent, uh, couple cases and surgical videos, and we'll have time for questions. So um, as we all know, glaucoma is the second leading cause of irreversible uh, blindness, uh, second only to macular degeneration. And in the US, there are more than, more than 3 million uh, people diagnosed with glaucoma age 40 and uh, older. And 90% of patients in US have open angle glaucoma. And the, the most con concerning fact is uh, only 50% of patients who have glaucoma uh, are aware of their uh, diagnosis. So here, here you can see the distribution, uh, the prevalence of glaucoma uh, per state. So in average, it's 1.9%. It varies from 1.4 to 3%. And uh, not surprisingly, as our population ages and by uh, 2050, uh, number of uh, people age 65 and above gonna double uh, in comparison to uh, 2000. So the number of patients with glaucoma, uh, there will be a 270% uh, rise uh, projected by 2050. And the current treatments we have for glaucoma, it's topical medications, uh, micro uh, minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries, and that the, uh, the uh, other end of the spectrum are incisional glaucoma procedures like traps and tubes. 
So in the recent decade, the mixed procedures are not only uh, filling the gap between the uh, drops and the laser procedure as, at one end and incision glaucoma procedures at other end, but actually uh, recent data supports that they are kind of overlapping, taking over um, some treatment options as um, both in early glaucoma and also in, in, in severe stage glaucoma. So the, the topical medications are around for, for a long time, but uh, they're not as safe as we thought uh, earlier. So they carry burden both on uh, uh, our side and most, most importantly, the, the patient side. So there is a huge issue with uh, compliance, persistence, adherence, uh, a major issue on, on our side with uh, all the time that we're taking to educate uh, patients to, to do all the uh, refill, to follow up on the uh, uh, compliance of the patients. Uh, and on the patient side, it's the cost, it's the systemic side effects, it's the topical side effects, the disease uh, related uh, health quality of life and the ocular surface um, issues. So. Uh, topical medications, they act uh, on the, uh, the topical uh, site uh, on the multiple levels. They're uh, disturbing the tear film, they're uh, decreasing the number of goblet cells in the conjunctiva, uh, they inhibit the proliferation and growth of the epi corneal epithelium, uh, and uh, on the trabeculum meshwork, there are some data supporting that they're uh, inducing the uh, trabecular cell apoptosis and uh, causing some uh, oxidative stress on the trabecular meshwork level. And here can, you can see uh, some, some common topical side effects such as uh, prostaglandin associated uh, or the orbitopathy, uh, the iris color change also from prostaglandin analogs. Um, Topically, uh, the contact dermatitis, and uh, on the uh, below and the right uh, picture, uh, our um, allergic conjunctivitis. So, what can we do? How, how can we help uh, our patients to reduce reduce the burden of the uh, the drops? Uh, so, nearly four million uh, patients. Uh, 4 million cataract surgeries are done in U.S. Um, every year, and 20% uh, out of this number, uh, the patients have concurrent uh, glaucoma. And the, the number of cataract surgeries um, is estimated to go up uh, 3% every year. So uh, you, you all guys are at the front line of uh, eye care and the, the, the cataract and the glaucoma patients are going to end up in your chair first rather than in the subspecialty uh, ophthalmology uh, clinic. So you have a, a great opportunity to, to uh, impact patients' uh, life with this long-term uh, potentially blinding disease. Uh, so the cataract surgery, it's a nice chance to also address the glaucoma. So uh, let's look into the recent data that supports the safety and efficacy of minimally invasive glaucoma procedures. So as we all know, the, the uh, aqueous outflow, it's mainly through the conventional uh, way through the trabecular meshwork, through the collector channels, and downstream into the episcleral veins. Uh, and about 15 to 20 percent, it's through the uveoscleral out, outflow through the ciliary body uh, muscles. And the resistance in glaucoma patients, the resistance within the conventional outflow uh, can come uh, from all the levels, starting from tobacular meshwork it's itself, uh, through the uh, uh, downstream to the uh, Schlems canal, the collector channels, and also uh, the episcleral veins. So, 
how are the mix procedures and mix devices uh, addressing the high eye pressure? So we can, there are some disruptive procedures that where we're removing uh, tissue when we're unroofing the Schlem's canal by, by removing trabecular meshwork and it can be done by uh, different uh, ways and procedures like dual, dual blade, conioscopy assisted uh, transluminal trabeculotomy uh, and trabectome. Uh, there are uh, canal dilating uh, procedures uh, where uh, an ABIC device uses a special catheter uh, threading through the Schlem's canal and uh, dilates the canal uh, with viscoelastic. Uh, and the Omni device uh, has dual function. It can uh, dilate the canal, but it also can uh, remove the trabecular meshwork tissue. Uh, and there are two stents uh, currently av available. Uh, so the, the first is the eye stent inject, uh, or the, its older version and first generation um, eye stent, uh, which, is, which is basically a canal neutral pr procedure. It just bypasses the, the canal and drains the aqueous uh, from the AC um, into the uh, col uh, collector uh, channels. And there is the hydrus device, which is a larger device, it has not only, uh, uh, it doesn't only bypass the uh, uh, trabecular meshwork, but it has also a, a scaffolding uh, effect, which is unique to the uh, hydrous mic micro stent. So here you can see uh, almost uh, every device that uh, is there available, one of them, uh, the side pass, uh, that it, it's on the left lower, uh, uh, part was recalled uh, a couple years ago because of the uh, corneal endothelial cell loss on their uh, five five year follow up. So uh, let's just briefly look into the all the options and uh, to 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 see what what device and what procedure does uh, which which part specifically. So. Uh, so we can increase the mix by, by using the mix procedure. We can increase the uh, trabecular outflow. Uh, so um, as mentioned above, by removing the tissue, by doing a canaloplasty, dilating the Schlem's canal, and by uh, putting a uh, bypass stent. Um, and uh, the space, the uveoscleral space, we don't have anything available. Um, so, so the side pass um, stent was uh, recalled and the uh, I stand Supra is still uh, pending its um, FDA approval. Um, and uh, there are also uh, lab forming uh, procedure, which is uh, considered the mix plus procedure because it's, uh, although it's minimally invasive, it creates blab and it can lead to all the uh, side effects and complications that are uh, specific to blood forming uh, procedures like trabeculectomy. And there is also um, an option to treat the ciliary body processes by doing an endocyclophotocoagulation uh, and reducing the production of the aqueous fluid. So, uh, now increasing the the, the uh, trabecular out outflow by removing the tissue it can be done by cohook dual blade by trabectome and by a procedure uh, gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy uh, which can be done with um, suture an eye track or an omni device and all these uh, three groups of procedures can be done during the cataract surgery and as a standalone procedure. So the Kahook dual blade is a special uh, blade uh, that has, so it's a uh, two blades on the, on, on, the, on the ramp that per, uh, removes a strip of trabecular meshwork uh, mechanically. The trabectome, it also removes the, uh, a trabecular meshwork tissue uh, by using the electro cautery. 
the gonioscopy assisted uh, transluminal trabeculotomy um, so with the uh, eye track on above picture you can see the eye track so it's a device that both eye track and omni uh, are devices that are using a, a catheter that is thread into the schlems canal and by retracting it injects uh, viscoelastic into the schlems canal and dilates uh, both the schlems canal and also uh, has some role in uh, dilating the proximal portion of collector channels. And these two devices can also be used not only to dilate the Schlems canal, but by just mechanically using the catheter to remove the trabecular meshwork. And let's now talk about the stents um, that we have. So two stents that are available on the market. On the left uh, side, you can see the first generation I stand, the first mixed device that was um, approved by FDA back in 2012. Um, and then six years later, the, the Glaucos, uh, the same company, um, came up with uh, I stand inject, which is smaller uh, device. Uh, and uh, there are two devices in the same injector. Um, and uh, in the in the right side, it's the Hydrus uh, microscan uh, by uh, uh, Iventis, and this stents um, can be done only during cataract surgery, so they're not approved to be done as a standalone procedure. So the uh, I stent uh, inject; it's the smallest device that uh, uh, is used in in, in in human body. It's a titanium device. Um, uh, and MRI compatible, and uh, it's placed uh, nasally during the cataract surgery, and it uh, bypasses the trabecular meshwork. Both devices basically work. The principle is the same. It's just the eye stent inject. You can do place two uh, stents at the same time. Um, and the Hydrus device is a larger device. It's um, eight millimeter long. It's a curved device uh, to match the curvature of the Schlems canal. Um, it's a titanium, it's a, a nickel um, and titanium alloy. It's the same uh, material that it, it's used in the uh, coronary bypass uh, surgeries. Um, and the titanium cover, basically it's done to prevent an, uh, an illusion of nickel and in the studies, the safety is uh, uh, 36,000 times uh, safer than the allowed uh, level of the nickel uh, uh, th that is required by the FDA. So it was approved in 2018. And out of all the mentioned minimally invasive glaucoma procedures, there are only three uh, devices that had has been shown their efficacy and safety in randomized controlled trials. So the eye stand, uh, which has a two year follow up and um, it showed uh, a decrease in intraocular pressure uh, by 8.4 uh, millimeter, millimeters of mercury. Uh, and CyPass uh, device, which was, so the pivotal trial was two year follow up, it was approved. And then at five year uh, follow up, um, and, uh, it it showed that there is a clinically significant decrease in endothelial cell count. So the device was recalled from the market. And uh, the third one is the Hydrus device, which the pivotal trial was two year follow up, but the five year data was recently presented uh, at uh, 2021 American Glaucoma Society meeting. So um, the Hydrus device, it's a flexible, uh, biocompatible, um, eight millimeter long micro stand. It, um, it has three parts, the inlet, the transitional zone, and three windows. So it's curved and matches the Schlems canal. The inlet itself and about 25 to 50 percent 
of the transitional zone, it stays in the anterior chamber. The windows, they face the trabecular meshwork on the anterior chamber and the, the back part of the stent, it's completely open. So it's, it's, it is facing the collector channels and by being completely open, it's not uh, covering the collector channels. And on, on top of bypassing the trabecular meshwork, it also uh, scaffolds the, the Schlems canal. Uh, it dilates um, about four times after placement. And here you can see so how it works, the three mo model. Uh, so it bypasses by the um, inlet and transitional zone staying in the interior chamber. It dilates, as you can see, uh, the difference between above and below uh, um, histopathology uh, slide, the Schlems canal. And it's, it's the only device that spends three clock hour or 90 degrees of uh, Schlems canal. So it's, uh, and here are the studies, uh, three studies so the eye stent, uh, the first eye stent uh, inject uh, included around uh, 200 patients and the largest study so far is the Hydrus, uh, which included 556 patients. Uh, it was done in nine countries and 40% of patients enrolled were uh, out of US. So, they enrolled mild and moderate primary open angle glaucoma uh, patients with cataracts on one to four medications. Uh, they didn't have any prior glaucoma procedures and they uh, might have had SLT, uh, selective tracheal uh, plasty. Uh, so they did a washout both at baseline and also at the end of the two year uh, follow up and they randomized treatment. So patients two to one, two for uh, cataract and hydrus uh, group and one to cataract standalone group. And the endpoints, the first primary endpoint was 20% reduction in washed out uh, diurnal um, pressure. The secondary endpoint was change in mean washed out um, intraocular pressure and safety and uh, efficacy was uh, looked at every um, each each visit. And here, what uh, the two-year follow-up study uh, showed, which led to the approval of the hydrus. So, at uh, two-year, uh, at one year, uh, so primary endpoint, uh, more than 85% patients met primary endpoint in the hydrus group uh, versus 70% in cataract standalone group. Uh, at a two year, this gap slightly increased 77% uh, versus 57% uh, of patients in standalone cataract group. And this is the secondary endpoint which showed uh, the difference in, at the first year follow-up, more than two uh, points of uh, pressure reduction and uh, the difference sustained at uh, two year um, at also 2.3 millimeters of mercury difference uh, between two groups. Uh, and these are the number of patients that were medication free. Uh, so this is the two year follow-up and uh, the, the, the effect sustained, so this is the longest so far available data on the uh, mixed devices. So at five year, 66% of patients that have uh, cataract procedure with hydrus were medication free. So, and the, this slide shows that the inclusion, the, the, the patients that were included in the study were well represented. It's a real li uh, life uh, representation. So on the left, uh, you can, on the left and right, on the left, you can see the number of medications that um, uh, uh, patients uh, that have glaucoma are the cross-sectional data. And on the horizon study, it's, it matches the real life uh, situation. And 
uh, at two year. Um, so pa patients that were taking one medication before the surgery at two year follow up, 86% of them were medication three. And this effect sustained uh, also at five years. So more than 70% of patients that were taking one medication before the surgery were medication three. And uh, for the for me as a glaucoma specialist, this this is more most uh, impressive slide. So uh, just remember that majority of patients at, at uh, enrollment were mild glaucoma patients, and patients that have only cataract surgeries, more than six percent, six point four percent of patients at five-year follow-up, they did require incisional major glaucoma surgery. It was either trabeculectomy or a tube shunt or cyclooblative procedure. And that number dropped to 2.5% in the group that had cataract and hydrus. And this is not um, a surprising number. Um, so there, there is a misconception about minimally invasive glaucoma procedures. Uh, we initially thought that if the, the glaucoma is mild and early, we should use a less invasive procedures, smaller stents. But uh, when we're seeing a patient with mild disease, we don't know how soon they're going to turn into a moderate or advanced disease that will require a major surgery. And this data also, um, so recently published data on the selective laser trabeculoplasty out of the UK, the light study also showed that treatment naive patients that were in, in, enrolled in the study at three year follow up, uh, around also 5% of the patients that were in the medication group required a trabeculectomy. So mild disease no treatment, and at three years, uh, some of them require uh, trabeculectomy. In uh, opposite of the laser treatment group, none of them required uh, trabeculectomy at three-year follow-up. So uh, let's talk about patient selection and post-operative care. Uh, so, Patients who are eligible to get uh, not only hydrus, but all the, also this, this uh, speaks to the uh, Gaucos uh, eye stand. So they should have an open angle. Uh, they should have uh, clear, no uh, significant corneal opacities that will uh, block, block the view during the surgery. Uh, they can be on no medications. They can be up to on, on all the classes of medications and um, having a, a prior uh, laser trabeculoplasty is not an indication that uh, they can't get a, a, a trabecular meshwork stent. So uh, the preoperative gonioscopy is very crucial, not only to establish that the angle is open, but to note any anatomical abnormalities that can uh, change the technique uh, of the procedure. And currently, the uh, trabecular meshwork stents, both hydrous and um, eye stent, are approved uh, for mild and moderate disease only. So here you can see a mild disease, where is no visual field loss, but uh, there should be a characteristic optic nerve um, damage. Uh, a moderate disease when there is uh, visual field loss only on, on one uh, hemifield and not involving involving five, uh, the central five degree. And currently it's not approved to be done in severe glaucoma, but there is uh, recent data. Uh, so one study is ongoing uh, to look into stents in severe patients and preliminary data show that there is an advantage to use the stents also in severe stage disease. So the hydrus, the contraindications uh, for placement at trabecular meshwork stent are uh, 
uh, traumatic uh, glaucoma, malignant glaucoma, uveitic glaucoma, uh, new vascular glaucoma, or any any uh, uh, anterior chamber angle abnormalities that will not let technically uh, to place the stent. So, um, and as for the post-operative care, it doesn't, so placement of the stent doesn't affect the post-operative care in majority of cases. So it's the same routine as just the standalone cataract surgery, seeing patients on day one, week one, uh, month one, and uh, after that, usually it's three months, uh, not only to make sure that uh, post up their uh, recovery is going well, but to to uh, repeat the glaucoma tests just to confirm that glaucoma was stable in this in this period. The drops, there is no um, change in the drop regimen. So antibiotics, um, non-steroidals, um, and steroids. And uh, obviously, if there is any uh, issues in the post-operative care, there should be a communication between a co-managing uh, eye doctor and the, the glaucoma surgeon. So, uh, and the, uh, the usually uh, the gonioscopy, it's a surgeon, uh, surgeon decides when he, he does gonioscopy in, in the post-operative period. I usually do it at uh, one week just to confirm the uh, proper placement of the stent. And um, here on the pictures, you can see a nice placement of the stent. Uh, so it, um, as mentioned uh, earlier, the, the inlet should be in the AC, about 50 to 25% of uh, transitional zone also should be in the AC and the rest, the uh, three windows should be nicely uh, visible in the Schlems canal. Sometimes, when the uh, trabecular meshwork is heavily pigmented, there is hard to see the windows. Uh, but the position of the inlet uh, tells uh, if it's properly positioned or not. There should, should not be a weird uh, angulation of the uh, inlet and the transitional zone. So, and, uh, and also one nice thing about uh, the, the stents, the trabecular meshwork stent and hydrus in particular, uh, that uh, usually patients that have glaucoma because their uh, conventional outflow is not working properly, they usually, yeah, they, they can very often have uh, 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 an early post-operative um, IOP spike. And the hydrus, um, the, uh, this slide showed that patients who had hydrus uh, stent, uh, even on day one, there is a nice drop in the uh, eye pressure. So even if it's not going down, at least it's gonna prevent this early spikes uh, of the pressure. And as per, per the safety uh, uh, data, so there is not much difference between the findings between, uh, there was no much difference um, between hydrus group and uh, cataract standalone group. There was some transient uh, micro hyphema and uh, layered hy hyphema, which was less than one millimeter, but which was uh, gone by one month in, in all the patients. There's, there might be some transient uh, corneal um, edema, also transient, then uh, more than 99% of patients, uh, the swelling, the corneal um, swelling, the stromal edema went away at one month. And as per the AC reaction, there was no, uh, no difference between uh, two groups. The hydrus group had uh, a slightly larger number of patients who had rebound inflammation, but it uh, was uh, everything resolved with uh, just topical steroid uh, drops. And here yeah, you can see that as per the uh, anterior chamber cell and flare, uh, all the numbers are exactly the same between two groups. As per the post-operative events, uh, so not much different. The hydrus group had less as expected IOP spikes. Uh, there was no hypotony in either group. Uh, same uh, number of patients that uh, the vision was uh, worse um, at two years. Uh, and 
the same number of patients that uh, less, actually less patients in the hydros group progressed uh, by visual field uh, 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 measurements uh, at two year and also uh, the, the gap uh, sustained at four year uh, follow up. And uh, because um, it's an extra stent in the anterior chamber, there, there are some patients that have uh, posterior synechiae, but it, it was just only on the gonioscopic exam. It didn't lead to difference um, in uh, IOP measurements. And as per the, after the findings in the CYPASS stand that led to the recall of the device, uh, the FDA reinforced the need for very close monitoring for the endothelial cell count in all the devices that were out there already approved in the market and that uh, are pending approval. And as you can see at five year, there is uh, uh, no difference between the hydrus and cataract group and the cataract group alone uh, uh, as per the endothelial cell count. And uh, obviously the surgeon should be uh, a reliable backup if uh, the surgeon uh, should be uh, aware if there is um, the uh, uncontrolled IOP, if there is any issues with hypotony, if there is non-resolving significant hyphema, um, if uh, device is not properly positioned, positioned, if there is uh, chronic inflammation that does not go away with just topical medications, and if glaucoma is progressing despite the pressure control. So, uh, and the take home points that now, today we have the data that supports uh, not only the safety, but the efficacy of the minimally invasive uh, glaucoma procedure, specifically the the longest follow-up, five-year follow-up for the Hydrus uh, device. And the cataract surgery, it's just one, one chance for the patient, not only to improve the vision. Uh, the same way we all are discussing uh, the refractive outcome with the patient, uh, offering them and uh, educating them on the stigmatism correction, on the options of the uh, basic and premium IOLs. Um, I strongly believe that our job also is to give them the option of uh, addressing the eye pressure at the time of the cataract surgery. And the, the data strongly supports uh, that the stents are uh, efficient. They are very, uh, a nice way not only to to lower the medication burden for the patient, but most importantly to put them in the safer position in the future for them uh, to lower the chance of them requiring a, a major uh, incisional uh, glaucoma procedure. And uh, at the end, I'm gonna. I'd like to uh, present just two two cases that uh, I saw during this last last month. So the first patient was referred for uh, cataract and glaucoma evaluations. 67 year old African American lady. Her main complaint was blurry vision and glare, which was getting worse in the last six months. Um, her best corrected vision was 2040. Um, slightly high pressures a bit thin uh, corneal thickness. Uh, on exam, she had two plus uh, uh, nuclear sclerosis, uh, symmetric increased cup to disc ratio. Um, and uh, on, on the testing, it showed mild disease with some um, NFL and ganglion cell complex loss, but uh, normal visual fields. And these are the options that were discussed with the patient and offered to the patient, either to, to start the drop and to address her uh, cataract, um, to uh, do a laser procedure to address the pressure either before the cataract surgery or after the cataract surgery, and to put uh, 
to do a, a trabecular meshwork stent uh, during the cataract surgery. And patient uh, opted for the hydrous mi micro stent, and she had both eyes done. Uh, four months post op, she says 2020, and her pressures are in mid teens uh, without any medications. And here you can see a, a short video of the, the eye stand uh, placement. So uh, to be able to visualize the trabecular mesh work, uh, I'm using a special Gonio uh, lens. So, and, and another option, so this is, uh, nowadays there, there is also um, data that supports that uh, we combining different types of mixed procedures that address different levels of resistance that can give us all, uh, an additional pressure lowering effect, which can be used in moderate or uh, severe glaucoma patients. So, uh, using a uh, canaloplasty with uh, an either Omni or eye track device, dilating the canal itself, not only the canal itself, but also downstream the proximal collector channels. And after dilating the canal 360 degrees, uh, then placing uh, a stent uh, just to uh, keep the canal open to scaffold the stent, uh, gives extra one or two points, which can be crucial in patients who have uh, mo who are who are moderate and who are at higher risk of uh, going into the severe um, stent. Uh, basically, in the second clip was uh, the combined procedure: the canaloplasty with an omni device, and then after dilation, placing a, a, a stent. And the, the, this, this was the, the patient that I choose to do a combined procedure. So uh, completely different story, uh, younger uh, gen gentleman. Uh, no. Yes. So um, he, um, on the right eye, he has severe glaucoma. Um, he had uh, three SLT procedures in the past. He had some issues with compliance. At some point, he was on four medications, but uh, when I saw him first time, he stopped all his medications because um, severe dryness, redness, uh, which was giving him a, a blurry vision on top of his worsening cataract. On the left eye, he had a sad event. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, for his severe glaucoma. So he had uh, a glaucoma drainage implant placed uh, about seven years ago, uh, which uh, failed a couple years later. Then he had a second device placed in a different quadrant. Uh, and the second device um, um, eroded um, twice. He had two surgeries to revise the device. Uh, but eventually it led to end of tolomitis and he had a vitrectomy. Uh, now he has just um, LP uh, at, at that eye and um, not surprisingly, he, he wasn't very thrilled to hear that he might need the same type of device in his uh, only seeing eye. Um, and uh, uh, although he's, he was severe disease, uh, uh, functionally monocular uh, and uh, his one of his main issues was also worsening cataract. So I discussed with him an option to do the combined procedure. Um, so canaloplasty, hydrous microstand, and cataract uh, surgery. But uh, him understanding that this is just most likely a temporary solution, just to postpone an inevitable incisional surgery. Um, and he, he uh, agreed to that. So he's, when I saw him, his pressure was 32. Uh, in his right eye on three classes of, uh, of meds. Uh, and he had clinically significant cataract and severe disease uh, with a structural uh, change and uh, inferior uh, orchid scotoma, which was uh, approaching the fixation. And these were the options that I, I discussed, either increasing the, the drops, uh, which he had issues with compliance before, 
um, not not just because he he doesn't care, but because the drops were really making the surface uh, just uh, severely dry. Uh, 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 a less favorable option of doing his fourth SLT, which the chances of its wor working are very low. Uh, he didn't want uh, to to even discuss the drainage implant. Uh, on the on the, that eye, and uh, he opted to go with a combined procedure. And uh, I saw him recently at five months after uh, uh, surgery. His vision improved from 2080 to 2040. His pressure is 17 on just one one medication. I'm happy to take um, any Thanks questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Castanian, sure. for such a wonderful presentation. That was amazing. We have a ton of questions. If you okay. wouldn't mind answering sure. a few of these. How soon after MIGS would a decrease in IOPs be observed? So, uh, so as, as we saw, it can be seen just day, starting day one. Usually, uh, I continue their glaucoma medications. I tell them that the first month or two, it will be back and forth. The pressure can fluctuate. If I see a 50% reduction from baseline, I stop. Uh, two medications and then follow follow up in one week or one month so I don't change my follow-up routine based on the pressure if it's less than 50 percent about 30 percent I stop one medication but always communicating with patient that this is if we stop the medication and then pressure goes up we are back on the medication it's not a failure it's just a natural course of the of the process makes sense thank you how much of the trabecular meshwork is typically removed at each procedure to be effective? So, um, there usually the base, depending on what device we're using. So, if the Kahook dual blade is used, you can, uh, just because of the technique of the surgery, you can only remove the nasal trabecular meshwork. If uh, the suture or an omni or an eye track device is used you can technically remove all 360 uh, trabecular mesh work um, but uh, because removing 360 trabecular mesh work um, the most common post-operative complication is severe hyphema nowadays and the data supports that actually there is no difference if you remove 180 degree and usually inferiorly which leads to less severe hyphema uh, so if necessary, it's either 90 degree nasal with Kahook dual blade or 180. Sometimes when the disease is severe enough, all 360 degrees. Thank you. Can more than one hydrus microstent be implanted at one time? So it's not, it's not approved. Uh, there are some off-label uses, but it's not going to be uh, basically, it's an off-label uh, use of the hydras, the two uh, devices, and uh, the insurance company is not going to cover for the second hydras, so it's going to be a, uh, an extra cost. The, nowadays, there are studies that are looking into a standalone hydras, which will be great because uh, it, all the data supports that it's safe. So, and there are a lot of patients that already had their cataract surgery, but still will benefit from the stent. So why not to give them that opportunity? Absolutely. How does dilating the Schlem's canal increase outflow if most of the resistance to aqueous outflow comes from the trabecular meshwork? So uh, legit question. Uh, just hydrus not only dilates the, oh, the, the canaloplasty. So the uh, because we don't have uh, retro, uh, it, all the data is retrospective with the canaloplasty, not the hydrus uh, or the um, eye stent. The dilation, um, the idea is that it's not only dilates the canal, but it also dilates the collector channels. And there, there is some histological data that supports glaucoma, that showed that glaucoma patients have what's called herniations of the trabecular meshwork into some collector channel. So the dilation actually um, opens up these herniations. 
and uh, we don't know how long the effect will last. So that's why so far the stenting has been shown a better option, but the dilation uh, has two advantages. First, it can be done as a standalone procedure. And second, it can be combined with the stent. So you're dilating the canal collector channels and you're supporting the dilation with the stent. Thank you. Okay, two more questions. What is the learning curve for surgery to implant the hydrus or the tissue removal? The eye stent appears an easier procedure to learn. So for me, during the fellowship, I did all the mixed procedures. Uh, for me personally, the hydrus was easier because it's just a larger device. Uh, it goes into the, the canal. Uh, you can tell real time that it's in so there are no there are no doubt because i've seen a few patients with uh, i stand the first generation that were just it's very easy to go in and if the surgeon is not familiar with the structures of the angle just go in and put it in the ciliary body put it in the uh, scleral spur it's just uh, the, the device will go in very easily because it's a sharp device um, usually it takes about at least 20 surgeries for any angle procedure in my experience and the data supports that uh, to, to be uh, comfortable with the device. Perfect. But I, yeah, I don't think that uh, I stent is easier than Hydrus. They're basically, uh, and usually surgeons choose a procedure it's hard to do all of them at the same level uh, choose the procedure that they're more comfortable with that makes sense last question what is the likelihood of either hydrus or eye stent needing replacement after a number of years for instance due to occlusion of the drainage site so so far at the five-year follow-up with the hydrus although about 7% of patients had some uh, posterior synechiae. Uh, even if the synechiae were occluding the uh, inlet itself or transitional zone itself, it didn't show that it affected the pressure because of the not so multiple model effect of the hydrus. The maybe the inlet is closed, but because of the scaffolding, because of the windows facing the TM, it's still working. So, and uh, in the study itself, there was no reports of needing to replace the hydrus. Uh, and also technically it will be different to go in because there are obviously some adhesions to the device itself and just to uh, remove the hydrus. But so far there is no, uh, we, we don't have enough follow-up sure. to see if we, we will need or the patients will need that, let's say, in five years, 15 years uh, down the road. Yeah, that makes total sense. Well, thank you, Dr. Castanian, sure. for a wonderful lecture. For all of our virtual attendees, uh, this is the conclusion of our event. Have a great evening.